So what's the real value of using digital transformation and leveraging technology and e-commerce? Do you know? Well, you're about to find out through this 45 minute panel session. And this will be this will be held by and moderated by uh, Sanjay Desai. Uh, Sanjay is the regional talent director at Tumena International. And Sanjay has also held senior supply chain positions at many, many, many companies. And I'm sure he'll like to tell you more about himself as he goes through the through the session. So Sanjay, uh, happy to hand this over to you and have a have a great panel session. Thank you so much, Bob, and thanks to Logisim for arranging this wonderful session. I also want to thank all the delegates who joined today, giving their personal time and have logged in already. So thank you so much. Uh, we have a wonderful subject today, and especially after COVID, this has been probably the talk of the town in terms of digital transformation, leveraging technology, and whether my job is on the line, and so many other questions. So today, we'll try to address a few of them given the time of 45 minutes. Now, digital transformation is not about technology, at least for me, having worked with some of the best brands in the world like Unilever, Apple, Dell, Motul, ExxonMobil, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Huntsman, and Verifone, and having handled uh, nine to 10 different commodities globally with supply chain model, with all the supply chain models of B2B, B2C, tiered model, as well as direct and indirect. Having seen all that and having done a lot of uh, evolution on the technology side, on the warehousing side, on the people, I always see, I always maintain that uh, transformation is about people first, then processes and the tools. And the tools means technology. Now today we'll bring out elements of those and how organizations and leadership take a stand on the technology transformation and how the success may would look like. With that. I would like to, I, I would like my panel to self introduce themselves, starting with Preeti. Go to you, Preeti. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Preeti, uh, I head supply chain technology for Asia Pacific uh, for Johnson and Johnson. Glad to be here. Axel. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Axel Herzhauser. I'm the head of business development at Siva Logistics for Southeast Asia and Pacific. I'm based here in Singapore. And it's great to be back at Lochisim. Thank you, Axel. Carsten. Yeah, this is uh, Carsten. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a general manager for logistics solutions for the automation part of uh, Schaefer Systems International. I um, was until recently based in uh, Singapore for the last 20 years. So I'm happy to be back in Logisim. I've recently relocated uh, to Dubai um, doing the same thing here, trying to promote the automation. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Justin. Hi, everyone. I am Justin Goldston. I'm a professor of product and supply chain management at Penn State University, and I'm also a co-founder of Sidtech, um, a blockchain organization where we're looking to 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 introduce and democratize blockchain and artificial intelligence for everyone. Thank you, Doctor. And Richard. Let's move on. And as Richard comes back onto the TV, we can also ask him to read to, to introduce himself. So let me start with our academician today. Right. And Dr. Justin, I would like to understand what is actually mean a digital transformation and more from a world of transformation, and what are the critical elements which are related to? Yeah, so so thank you for that question, and 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 to to stress that term transformation, I always refer to it as transformational leadership. And whenever we think of transformational leadership, we it's not really yes, it begins with the leaders of the organization, but to practice transformational leadership. It can be to the with the employees. It can begin with the employees. It can begin with the project managers. And you make a good point where when we talk about digital transformation, it's not just about the technology. You know, it's about, you know, we also talk about people, process, and technology, but I also want to put data into a different bucket, a separate bucket outside of technology. 
right? Because it's very important. And I think that with these emerging technologies, especially with artificial intelligence, where in my opinion, it's really machine learning, and a lot of all these solutions where where data is going to be very important you know so so if you look at you know uh, uh forecasting tools such as demand sensing you know as we look as we bring in e-commerce the e-commerce aspect you know that's going to be very important as we move to this digital transformation journey with the emerging technologies because i think that we are we are entering into a new <laughs> a new frontier with all of these technologies edge computing uh, machine learning and, and things like that perfect thank you and and i like you know you adding data there because data is probably as uh, there are a lot of cliches around data is a new gold and you know how data can really impress and make sure that uh, you can you have predictive and prescriptive analysis so i would like to move over to richard and then richard from a transformation perspective because you do so much of transformation from a system perspective you work with a lot of your clients probably what i think is the challenge for leadership today or even a couple of years back and in the future is a phenomenon called the inventors paradox and the inventors paradox to me is when you have the freedom you actually do not want to change, right? You don't want to change. You don't feel like you want to change. So where do organizations start today? Is the need is going to be the necessity or is the customer satisfaction or is the con? Where is the, where is the starting find for an organization and what's your guidance today? I think, I think, um, thank you, Sanjay. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. I, I think, I think that's one area where COVID had a big influence, which is showing everybody that, A, your systems weren't perfect, probably weren't as good as you expected, um, and definitely not as resilient as you expected. If we, if we had talked two years ago, everybody would have said that their supply chain is very resilient and their supply chain could handle any kind of disruption. I think COVID, Suez Canal, other impacts have shown to everybody that the supply chain is not as resilient. So I think that the, the fact that you need to change is obvious for everyone now. I don't think anybody questions that. So I think the question now is how do you do it? How fast can you do it? And that will vary tremendously organization for organization. And also, since you're redesigning your supply chain, what are your drivers? Again, a couple of years ago, the only driver was cost. Um, now you see companies taking uh, geopolitical considerations, uh, taking environmental considerations. So cost may not be the only driver in how you design or how people design their new supply chain. Hopefully it's not the only driver. Yeah, and, and Richard, staying on with you on that good point, do you see there is a, trans there is a transformation here in the mindset of your clients that Cost is not the primary first rung now, maybe second or third rung. Do you see that happening practically? Absolutely, yes. I think in every customer, big and small customer, um, they're 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 terrified with the with what's happening in the supply chain. Okay, they're terrified that ports could close again. Look at Singapore. If you had told me a month ago that we would have another lockdown, I would say, ah, not going to happen. We are in another soft lockdown. But this is this is moving very very fast, and I think companies really understand that. Yes, any size of company. They understand they have to make a change. Thank you, Richard. And, and I would like to stay with you, your introduction. We don't want to miss that. Please go ahead. No, Richard Ryan, been in Singapore for 16 years. Um, I work for Blue Yonder as industry uh, strategy, strategy industry for free PL and logistics systems. So thank you. Thank you for having me again, Sanjay. Thank you so much. And then let's move on to a bit of a technology, and I'll go to Preeti. And you know, Priti has the organizations start their journey of transformation. How important is the choice to look at your platforms, your architecture? And there are so many things come in mind. Your planning, because there are so many, there is so much value on the table. There are so many KPIs like scalability, load balancing in future, your cost, your ease of use. So, which are those critical factors and choices that you need to make early? Sure. 
and you know as rightly said by the previous speakers technology is one key part of the puzzle not the only piece but it's a very very uh, fundamental one right um, and to answer the question sanjay asked is i think having a solid foundation is very critical for any strategic uh, you know any strategic transformational initiative right so and there's always a fine balance on how much of uh, time resources and money that we're going to spend to build that foundation as against really motoring fast on that transformational journey right however again we should be very grounded and reminded of the fact that having a solid technology foundation really helps with three key areas uh, scalability reliability and sustainability right and without these we can't really uh, Uh, have massive transformations we could pretty much do you know pocs but that won't really help in the long term right so very critical um, and i think i'll go back to again bringing that out that couple of things that are key elements of that are having a very solid uh, data landscape um, and and having a data strategy right and when we talk about that it could mean in terms of having a common data layer across different multiple points that we're looking at truly thinking end to end and then last but not the least probably you know security is a key element of that so yes a combination of having that solid foundation with these elements um, is absolutely a must uh, while we begin this transformational journey sure and your security point is well noted we'll talk about it later with you you know during the program uh, one one element that you brought was a solid foundation and i'm just thinking we're talking about transformation word here from today we're looking to the future for next 2 3 years and we're saying we're going to use a lot of technology which is pretty advanced and the technology becomes redundant in every 6 9 or 10 months how do you marry these two stuff right the the, the future view and having a solid foundation do you think the current leadership would have the wisdom and the ability and the knowledge to actually think about it yeah i would just say when you know when we as simple as when we drive a car as we are moving forward we got to make sure that we have that rear view as well right and that's how we should approach it to this technological piece as well so i think as we are bringing in the new technologies and i think adoption of ai really going into uh, you know machine learning A, a fast adoption of machine learning techniques using ai the automated rpa and stuff but at the same time if we are not looking at the existing technology and how uh, the whole tlm and alm the ap application as well as the technology life cycle management uh, then you know we will always find ourselves at a balancing between do we adopt or you know uh, rightly invest in the new technologies as against look at uh, that our existing technologies are ending or you know they are reaching the near life wherein we have to uh you know we have to uh, take action otherwise sure. there is a vulnerability coming when it comes to security patches that are applied timely or it could even impact your core business operations right because if you're running on a technology it's not a i don't think it's an option anymore right so i think proactively looking at it in the past i would say majority when it comes to investment balancing or decisions we always put the technology and life cycle management and application life cycle management we used to historically put it you know uh, all the way to the back saying that it's much more important to invest in the future technology but i think we have to look at both as i said in the beginning and make sure we make the right investments so that as we move ahead we also yeah. have a stable back so and pretty uh, let's move to the last mile and let's move to kasten and kasan given what we heard and just now priti made to point dr justin brought data and priti talked about a solid foundation and then uh, uh, you know having a rear view driving right thinking that ahead kasan how companies can best leverage technology today what what examples that you have when you kind of talk to your clients You're on mute. Yeah, we can hear you now. Oops, you can hear oh, me or not? Okay, I didn't touch that. Somebody muted me here. No worries, I'm back. I hope. Um, <laughs> I said I think whatever was said, uh, especially by Priti just now, uh, it, it is very, very much applicable also to the intra logistics, to the solutions that 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 you will find in in warehouses, in distribution centers, in order fulfillment mm -hmm. systems. 
Um, I think on, on one hand, um, the uh, digital transformation, the digitization is, is, is driving the technologies forward, uh, uh, bringing new uh, technologies into the market. On the other hand, there's always a worry that that automation, adopting new technologies uh, uh, is an expensive, uh, un inflexible uh, exercise. So there's still uh, a lot of operations that, that are very shy of, of applying all these uh, technologies. And I think uh, what, what Pretty said just now very much brings it to the point. In the end, uh, you, 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 you have to, to find the right choice. Yeah, you, you have to really balance uh, your requirements to have to look what, what you need, what you want, what you want to achieve and then uh, um, uh, uh, select the correct um, technology that, that best suits you. Uh, instead of going back and look at what the competition is uh, doing, copy what, what others are doing, adapt new technologies just because they are state of the art, they are new, which is also a big mistake because not everything that is new is, is actually a, a, a perfect fit. So you, you may resort back to proven uh, so-called old-fashioned technologies. I think uh, uh, as, 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 a, as a user, as an operator, you have a big choice. You should not look at uh, what, what, what others are doing and really focus on what is the technology that best suits your individual requirements. Perfect. Thank you, Karsten. And then actually taking that forward, right, um, the technology and its scale will continue to evolve, right? Every, every, every couple of months, so there is something always on the anvil. And this will continue for the next even five to 10 years. Now in this environment as a service provider, 3PL, 4PL or 5PL, what is the, how did you operationalize this ecosystem with your clients? What are the options you have? Yeah, Sanjay, I, I, I agree with Karsten. I think it's a matter of what choice companies make, right? Which technologies they would, they would get with uh, technologies they develop or apply. And it, it's not always, uh, what a company would like to do, but I think what, what their market environment requests is important. And in that sense, I think uh, technology advances will continue to be so, uh, disruptors for some of the companies and logistics companies like us, right? We, we need to continuously invest in, in back office, uh, in a, into a back office digital strategy to drive the solutions for our customers. Uh, to put it in simple terms, Relying on digital digital technology will absolutely be the key for any logistics company. At Siva Logistics, we've been making investments to upgrade our digital toolbox, and we will continue to do this. Uh, we just launched My Siva. It, it's it's a it's it's a web based tool uh, for our customers for very simple pricing inquiries. Shipments can be booked with with a few clicks, relatively easy compared to the old traditional way how shipments. And uh, we have our Matrix SDM platform is basically, uh, it's, it's a platform where everything is centralized when it comes to customer data on one platform. And that includes the integration of external parties like marketplaces, brand.com platforms, integrators, or other external operators along the supply chain. Excellent. And, and actually you brought a good point about the MySiva. Is this initiative more uh, focused because of the requirement of, the, of your clients that you serve? Or is it something that SIVA wanted to do as a competitive age over rest of the other competition? I think it is part of the digital transformation that we've gone through, Sanjeev. It's not something because we would like to do it, so we ask our customers to do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's the simplicity of it uh, uh, that we have, and hence we've put this in place, right? It, it, it is not, I would say rocket science is not something that the market hasn't seen. I think many, many players in the market have the same. Obviously, we're trying to advance this with a few features uh, that put us ahead of the game if we can. Perfect. Talking about leveraging technology as our theme, and since now Siva is already investing money, I just have a very rhetorical question is, because now you are investing in technology and you have a MySiva and a few other technological aspects, you think customers come to you more often because now you're a technological player. So does it really have a, a cause and effect relationship or the customers really, it doesn't really matter to them in a, in a crude way? I think the customer would come to us, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Obviously there are commercial mm -hmm. reasons behind it and, and the customer focus is, is uh, uh, or being customer focused uh, is, is one of our top priorities, right? If customers wouldn't demand it, we probably wouldn't develop it as such. So hence, we see the demand in the market. It's part of the digital transformation that the market sees, and uh, we, we need to participate, and we are participating in this. Perfect. Perfect, Axel. We'll go back to Richard and say, having heard the 
the consistency part of it, the investment part of it, and then the technological advancement and separate yourself from the competition. As an organization embarks on a transformation journey, which are those key requisites or must have factors for a successful digital transformation? There could be many, you could just talk about a few, Richard. Um, I think first is having a, a solid plan, a plan that covers data, uh, covers training. You'd be amazed how many companies spend tens of millions of dollars in a new system, but doesn't want to spend money in training their employees. Hmm. Training is, is pivotal. Training is very important for security. Most of the security breaches come from people opening phishing emails, and security for the logistics business is is a is a really big worry with so many uh, large companies be being cyber attack. So I think first having a plan. Second, making sure your plan is at the pace your company can 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 do it. Uh, obviously, some large companies can go faster. Some smaller companies have to go slower. You, you just have to go at your pace. And make sure your goals are very well defined. So you're not changing goalposts as your plan evolves. And understand that you cannot solve all the problems at once. You're not going to be able to have a brand new super technology system that covers all the aspects in a month or in a year. And in many cases, it may take five or 10 years. But if you have a solid plan, if you train your employees and, and, and you're moving at the pace your company can, can do it, I think at the end, you will have a very good system. And for that feature, probably as an organization, I should know my customers, my ecosystem, and probably my next two, three years growth plans. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and understand your customer needs. You as a business are changing. Your customer is changing. So yeah. the fact that you've been working for a customer for 10 years doesn't mean that in the next three years, that's what he is expecting from you. So you really have to be close to your customers to understand what journey they are in and how you can help them in that journey. So it's really, it's really understanding and working with your customer base and supplier base, how you can be part of their journey and vice versa. Excellent, Richard. Well said. And just staying with you quickly and briefly, when customers, when clients approach you, what is the basic tendency? Is it to take a vanilla a package off the shelf as a vanilla or actually invest more in customization so you can actually have customer, customer segmentation models? What is generally the, the tendency? I would say uh, uh, principally in Asia, it went from everything super customized to as mm. vanilla as possible in the last three years. Okay, because they understand that once they customize, they cannot change the system. They cannot upgrade the systems. Uh, when you're talking of all these changes, you need to security, you need to be able to upgrade systems very quickly. So more and more, Sanjay, we see uh, vanilla as being the key element and really trying to walk away from customizations. More and more vanilla and walk away from customization. So you have sustainability as well as your costs right. are down and then you can take directions and shifts whenever you want it. Perfect. Correct. I will just go to Carson and in, in terms of the end customer, how to select the right solution, Carson? How do you advise your customers? Okay, I mean, Richard uh, already uh, brought it to, to the point to a certain extent. I mean, you, you have to be with your customer. You have to understand your customer. You have to... To, to, to strategize for the future. And that's, I think, where, where, where our digital transformation comes in uh, very handy, because in the end, it's, it's all about information. It's all about data to understand yeah. uh, what is happening in your operation, to, to be able to forecast which, what, what, what may happen uh, in, in the future. I mean, there's always this big unknown. Uh, we, we didn't expect to be where we are today, uh, a year ago. But yes, uh, with, with some with knowing the business, knowing where you want to go, uh, some some mid to long term strategy, uh, some some market analysis, uh, you do it anyway when you strategize, and that should in the end uh, allow you to find uh, the right the right balance between investment ROI, and then the adequate level of of technology. Yeah, the best solution may be to continue as is. The best solution may be to just go ahead, uh, just 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 change your warehouse management system. The best solution may be to put in some robots, whereas they don't work with some infrastructure around. Or you go into a high-end, uh, 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 super 
high-tech uh, uh, integrated solution. Yeah, but sure. in the end, the data and, and the strategy is the basis of everything. So, Kasten, right balance, right data, cost, customer satisfaction, sustainability. You think the clients really will have that sort of knowledge at that point of time when they approach you or, for example, Richard, and how do you advise them? Is it something you take on as your own responsibility? We we do. I, I believe our customers, they have more information than they, they themselves believe. I mean, it's, okay. it's very often the case that a customer, when, when we ask questions, a customer, I don't know, I don't know. And then... And then you sit down and and you and you analyze you 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 show what is possible with what kind of technology, and then that awareness. Oh yes, I know that. I know that. I know that. The awareness comes up, and 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 then our customers are actually able to to share much more information than they ever thought they they had on hand. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an iterative process. Uh, it's a lot of talking, but yes, we take that in our hand. Um, we 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 work with ready analyze data but we also look into raw data and extract what we uh, need uh, to, to to come to a solution so both ways are possible sure thank you Dustin. there's a question from uh from sarat oh okay uh dr justin would you like to take that quickly yeah. So, so visible, visible is a is an organization. They're 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 a purchasing they're a purchasing solution based in the UK, mm. um, and they just released a sustainable sustainability tracking um, solution uh, last year. Uh, Eco Ecovatus Eco Ecovatus um, is is another solution that that does that does uh, sustainability metrics. I'm not too I'm not too familiar with that one, but. Actually, uh, one of some of my students actually did a presentation on that one uh, two semesters ago. So that's how I was introduced to it. Um, but but that one that that solution looks promising as well. So I would check that one out. Thank you. All right. Coming back to Excel, right? Riding on the new way of e-commerce, uh, COVID actually pushed a lot of commodities, a lot of players, and anything that could go on an e-commerce platform. It actually has gone or it is in the midst of it, right? Now, as you as a third player, when you work with your clients, which could be at e-commerce or even still modern retail, uh, what are your thoughts on how the ecosystem players like omni-channel players, for example, or your logistics partners, how should they play this game? What should be the strategy for the future? Two questions, Sanjay. Um, I think there are several players involved along the e-commerce value chain, and most of them are actually directly linked to logistics, right? So in order to scale and to meet seasonal needs, uh, all e-commerce and omni-channel logistics players and everybody else along the value chain, they need to be multimodal. They need to be fast and flexible, right? The, uh, uh, th this it basically is the new normal, right? Nothing was uh, exactly the same way as it was before. And I would say the flexibility is ultimately key and consumer demand has not gotten easier. I think it became a lot more challenging. Now, it is more critical than ever, I would say, to integrate all these players along the supply chain or the e-commerce value chain directly and digitally in, into a platform. And uh, this backend logistics infrastructure is absolutely critical to sustain, to sustain in the e-commerce world, meaning all players need to be open to integrate others or to be equally integrated by others to make sure the flow of information will be given at all times. Perfect, Axel, you talked about multimodal. That itself is a big chapter actually. But since you talked about it, I just want to ask a question. Uh, from a SIVA service perspective, do you really have clients who would have used all the four ways, air, water, road, and train? And does it, does it really work very seamlessly? It does actually, and I think for us, we're quite lucky because we offer these, uh, I would say, air, ocean, ground services and rail in particular uh, as well, uh, out of one hand, uh, sometimes with some of our partners, but I think we manage them all ourselves. Now, in times when, in particular throughout COVID, I think uh, Richard highlighted it earlier, I think we had to be flexible. We just talked about the, uh, we talked about uh, the Suez Canal crisis that we've just seen recently where, you know, shippers were concerned whether their ocean shipments would get to Europe on time. They were not ready to pay uh, a full-blown air freight out of Asia into Europe. Uh, um, sea Air all of a sudden became attractive again, uh, where, where companies 
to, uh, went by ocean freight to the Middle East and then from there they airlifted it into Europe, for example, right? Uh, in times when, when borders were shut over here, we, we used some, cr we switched cross border uh, trucking business uh, to the water and, and in other cases the other way around. So I think being able to respond quickly is absolutely vital and critical for logistics companies, especially in these times. Excellent. So, so that kind of a mental transformation of not just sticking to either air or ocean, but actually using all the four classical modes, using costs as well as inventory working capital hedge is indeed started already within the organizations. That's good to know. Thank you. I'll, I'll go back to Preeti and, and you talked about security pretty early, right? How critical is the role of security in all this as we embark on different kinds of technologies, different users, and you work from home everywhere, work from anywhere, how security becomes a critical aspect and what do you think uh, specifically organizations are doing today? Sure. So I think simple answer to that is it's absolutely critical, right? And uh, security as a whole is a topic in itself, right? If we are really going into the depth and really thrashing it out. But I'll just make a few uh, comments on security as it has been mentioned across, you know, um, across different speakers. And first thing I would say is that uh, security is definitely not optional, right? It's not a nice to have anymore. The other thing is always we say that, okay, organizations have an uh, security experts or, uh, you know, ISRM departments or people who are looking at security. So it is not somebody else's accountability when we look at security alone. Right. So I think that is some that's a key message that I would say that if we think that somebody else is going to do the job for us, I think. And what do I mean by saying that is uh, every person uh, in supply chain needs to really look out for those risk signals. Right. And that risk signals couldn't happen anywhere, be it from a technology, be it from a process standpoint or be it, you know, in an actual operation and then make sure that the right organizational structure with the right experts who are able to come in and have the right guidance around what security measure needs to be put in place, either proactively or reactively. Right. And I think that is key. I think we most of our organizations have a good um, ISRM, which is the information security and risk, risk management um, uh, structure uh, organizationally to support this. But I think what is key is that everybody needs to have their eyes, ears, and all the senses open to be able to really pick those risk signals because uh, time is of a sense here, right? In terms of how can we really uh, manage it well. And then the other point I would really say is that, especially related to transformation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having the right security engaged upfront rather than you know later in the game is also very key because most of the time what we do is when we are looking at design we feel that let's let's come to a let's come to a particular point in time when then we engage different uh, you know uh, security experts or others but having them early on will really help us come up with a unified solution which is far more secure than looking yes. at it towards the end so you know and that's quite relevant to the topic of discussion here. Yeah, and you brought a point of risk assessment. Uh, do, are you kind of alluding to that the risk assessment done upfront, not just from a transformation perspective, but even from a process perspective, as well as from an IT hardware and software perspective is as important as compared to doing a risk assessment of your business when you go into a territory or in your market? What do you say about that? Absolutely. I mean, can't agree more on that. And that's where we are saying that, you know, it's when, when the risk assessment is done, it's not looking at, uh, you know, just one aspect of it. Right. And that's what we are saying that let's cover. So if you're talking about, say, connectivity. Right. So if you're, mm -hmm. you're really looking at that, uh, that end to end connectivity from a third party going to uh, the actual, you know, uh, from a service provider back into a particular organization, be it on a distribution network, be it on a manufacturing network and so on and so forth. So I think we have to look uh, externally and really end to end when we are looking at security measure. And that's where this collaboration and partnership is also key, right? When we do these assessments. Perfect. Excellent. I will go to Karsten again. And from, a, we, we talked about data today quite a lot. Now, when you work with your customers, especially on the last mile, right, on the warehousing, on the storage, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of trend uh, from shipping perspective, from a storage profile perspective, from an inventorized perspective, ABC analysis, right? And all these data actually goes into solution design. 
So what what is the role of a data into the digitization and how critical it is for the customers to understand uh, end to end? Um, yeah, okay, like we said earlier, I mean, the, the data is, is important to understand the business and in the end it, it drives the solution. Uh, it, it, it tells us what kind of, of solution we need, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, warehousing is most beneficial, what kind of picking technology uh, is most beneficial. So we, we analyze uh, the volumes, yes, on one hand, but also the, uh, the, the, the order profile uh, uh, to understand uh, how orders are made up. I mean, a system in e-commerce uh, looks different uh, to a system in, 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 in bulk delivery, in shop deliveries. Uh, there's others, again, for omni-channel uh, solutions. Yeah. So the data, they, they, they tell us the direction. The data also allow us to simulate. I mean, we can, we can yeah. feed the solution mm -hmm. in the end, uh, with, with, with live data to see how does the system uh, behave. Uh, where where do we have bottlenecks? Where do we need to 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 to, to make changes? Uh, what is if the business changes? Yeah, if I now convert from 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 shop delivery to e-commerce, we can also see how the system uh, uh, reacts to that. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. uh, it is uh, a very black and white these days, where 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 it's said that that you can't run a shop delivery with an e-commerce facility. Now, if you if you plan ahead, if you strategize, if you have that in mind, you can also make the systems flexible enough to do that. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you should not yeah, trust or not design uh, uh, the system always to the point. Uh, uh, I mean, the data give you a guide, but in the end, you need your strategy, you need your flexibility, you need to be prepared for, for still the unexpected. So you have yeah. to always keep the the border lines open so that that you can maneuver out of that system solution that the data prescribed to you to to main the flexibility which we all need these days perfect Carson. thank you uh, i will go back to dr justin and it's a slightly tricky question uh, the future as we as i always hear next couple of years they belong to the mixed professionals they call the left brain the right brain then the alpha generation, which I actually call as the post-COVID generation. I don't call them alpha generation anyway. The post-COVID generation is probably the right word. Now, with all the new generations coming on board, how do we stop the technology, which is which is having so much of uh, effect right now? How do we stop technology from crossing the social and ethical boundaries in a personal life, right? Is there a a natural inflection point or we need to force ourselves as leader to actually not allow cross that line that's a, that's an that's an excellent question it's actually it's actually one we're we're working on now so so i i work a lot with um the institutes for computational and data sciences um at, at penn state and and that is one that is one one hot topic in terms of ethics and in AI, for example, right? Because we do a lot. We, Penn State has made a lot of investment in terms of artificial intelligence over the last few years, and I'm actually writing a book entitled AI for Good, and there's a whole chapter in terms of ethics, you know. And and my proposal is that in order to to mitigate the risk of bias of yeah. discrimination within these algorithms you have to create diverse teams to develop these algorithms because yes yes these are emerging technologies but these technologies are created by humans right and that's that and that's the big thing we have to continue to remember right and there's been a number of different stories especially in here in the u.s you know, there's a number of stories about discrimination against African Americans, about Hispanics, about a bunch of different, a bunch of different, you know, demographics and, and, and minorities. And I think that if you introduce diverse teams, that is one step. The next step is to you perform external audits yeah. with diverse teams where you have a consensus base where you say, okay, yes. 
This is this is indeed indeed ethical algorithms. This is unbiased algorithms. This is non-discriminatory algorithms. And I think that in terms of in terms of you know these technologies and digital transformations, that's that's one step in in the right direction. I think that that is one way to mitigate the risk. There's always going to be risks, yeah. right? There's always going to be risks. I think that that's just that's just one proposed solution. <laughs> Thank you. And I, and I suppose I got what I, what I got from your last answer is we actually deserve to have a webinar on that subject only, Dr. Justin, in future. Just, just yeah, yeah. That's, that's an hour discussion in itself. Yeah, exactly. So the last, we already reached about just a couple of minutes left, so no more questions. Uh, I will reach out to each and every one of you and just give very briefly your takeaway for today in one or two sentences. One or two, not more. Dr. Justin, starting with you. I would say in terms of in terms of digital transformation, get back to basics, get back to data. Do not fall to the shiny shiny object syndrome, you know, <laughs> and just 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 build the digital transformation based on the organization's requirements. Thanks. Thank you so much. Pretty. Sure. Um, my my closing comment really would be the importance of data to digital transformation, you know, is as is almost same as what water is to the existence of life. Excellent. Axel? Yeah, I think uh, we, we talk a lot about technology, but ultimately I think digital transformation is not just about technology. Uh, we, we learned earlier that it's it's really about people, business, and, and how the, con uh, the technology combines all of this, right? It, it's, technology is not uh, it's not a trend or a buzzword, but it, it it's about, you know, through digital transformation, how business is being conducted nowadays. and, and being able to connect very quickly to customers will open doors for many companies. And that's really something that we need to be mindful of. So in my point of view, companies who see all of this as an opportunity rather than a challenge, they will be the ones being successful in the long run. Thank you. Excel, Carsten? I can only apply to everyone. Make use of the, the data you have on hand. Make use of the information you have when you apply the technology and make the right choice. Don't uh, just go for robotics because everybody wants it. <laughs> <laughs> right choice, perfect. <laughs> Richard? Yeah, and when you go back to the basic data, as was mentioned, go back to a whiteboard, start from zero. Don't, don't, don't start from last year. Don't assume that because you did something for 10 years, it was the right way. Start yeah. from the beginning, start from a blank board. And remember, if you don't train, if you don't educate your employees, they will not be able to follow the changes that are coming and they will not be able to help your plan. So part of it, it really is about education of customers, employees, and suppliers. Excellent, Richard. I like the word, go back to whiteboard. Absolutely, there's, there's a need of the hour. Something called autonomous, right? A, yeah. a combination of robots plus human beings as Japanese generally call it. Right. So excellent. Uh, that's that's the end of the show today. So I would like to thank all the delegates for joining today. There is some questions, although I thought the questions were a bit, a couple of less. They could have been a bit more. Thank you, each of you. Thank you, Dr. Justin, for taking the call at US. And I know it's like 4 a.m. for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Logism. Thank you, everybody Thank you who is much. behind the success of this uh, workshop. And namaste, back to you, Bob. <laughs>